Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, the wilds of Borneo. What to know before you go. Presented by NADHAB Expedition Leader, Pyle Meta. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Pyle. Thank you, Rob. Thank you so much. And a very, very warm welcome to everyone who's tuned in and listening in to this webinar. As Rob likely said, it is the Know Before You Go series webinar, and we are going to talk about our board nature. Right? So let's get started without much further ado. The Abonio trip is the exploration of the tropical jungle, right? It is, we are looking for wildlife, but in a very, very special habitat. And the experience of it is almost the opposite, if I can say, of what one experiences uh, while looking for wildlife in Africa. The habitat is different. The way you look for things is different. And of course, the weather and in every way, it's a totally different experience, right? So I'll come to more about it as we go ahead and look at the itinerary. But before I get to that, many times when you tell your friends and family that you're going to Borneo, their first question would be like, what? Where is it? So here's a little orientation of where Borneo is. So in the map here in front of you, you can see Asia and Southeast Asia. Borneo is this large island to the southernmost area of Southeast Asia. As you can see here, that the island is colored in two colors, right? So if you zoom in, sorry, you see that this large island of Borneo is occupied by three different countries. In pink here, is one of the smallest countries in the world called Brunei. The green here is Malaysia. And this here to the south, the largest area is Kalimantan, which is part of Indonesia. We on our trip to Borneo are going to be in the Malaysian part of Borneo, right? So when you land, you land in mainland Malaysia, that is here in Kuala Lumpur, when you enter the country, and then you fly to the Bonian states, right? So let me take you to the itinerary, right? So we start in Kuching, which is the largest city of the Sarawak state, right? So if I go back a little bit, this state is Sarawak, and this one is Sabah. Right, so we are going to land here in Kuching in Sarawak. And when you do that, right, so all of you, when you arrive, Americans have a visa on arrival. So when you land in Kuala Lumpur, you get your immigration stamp. However, very interestingly, in Malaysia, when you do the internal flight from mainland Malaysia to the island of Borneo in Kuching, here, you again have to go through immigration, right? But that's okay, that's part of the process. It's very smooth and you come and meet us and the rest of your group in Puching and that's where the trip begins. We spend two days here, two nights, and then on the third day, we fly to the state of Sabah. Again, there is immigration, okay, which we have to go through. Again, it's not a problem at all. It's just that keeping our space, of your passport pages, right? Once we come to Saba, we first go to Sepilok, we drive there. So a bus comes to receive us. We drive to Sepilok. Over there, we spend a couple of nights exploring the area, a very interesting forest nearby. And then from there, we go by boat to Turtle Island. We spend a night there from Turtle Island. We again take, do a little boat ride and another boat ride, this time up the river to Kina Batangan. Kina Batangan is our destination where we are going to be on the banks of the river 
and explore the forest alongside the river on the either side, right? River and forest. From Kinabatangan, after spending two nights there, we come to Danung Valley. But the, but the way we get there, it's quite interesting, right? So you come by boat, you reach the show, you take a bus, and you get to the big town, get to a big town. After the big town, after the bus, you transfer into four by four vehicles, and then get to Danum Valley, which is our grand finale and our final stop of our wildlife destinations, right? So this is where we spend three nights. And after Danum Valley, we fly, we again drive back to the little town and take a small flight to Kota Kinabalu, which is an international airport. And that's where we do our final dinner and depart to our next destination or to our homes, right? So that's just the overview of our itinerary. As you can see, in most places, we do two nights. Turtle Island is just one night. And Danum Valley is where we do three nights, right? And Kota Kinabalu is the final one night, right? This is the classic itinerary for our 2024 year, for the 2024 season. We also have one more version that is the photo itinerary. And the only difference there is that we don't do Turtle Island and that one extra night we do in Kinabatangan. We just feel that from photo opportunities, it's uh, more productive to have three instead of two days uh, up on the river looking for wildlife, right? So that's about the itinerary. Now, just looking at the wild, right? So our main, of course, the biggest highlight is the orangutan. However, there are many other pathways. Sorry, that's my dog. There are many other pathways that we are going to look for. Just give me a moment, please. There are many other primates that we are going to look for. And, but other than primates also, there are just many other interesting small and big wildlife that we are looking for, right? Remember, this is a tropical jungle that we are exploring and it has very high biodiversity, right? So little creatures, large creatures, some are very tiny creatures, but really vibrant. And the others are larger creatures, extremely well camouflaged, right? Look at this beautiful colugo here. The colugo. So these very, very interesting creatures, but also, other than that, there are different kinds of birds, plants, fungi, so much to see in forests like these, right? And besides that, the reason why I'm telling you is also from the photo perspective, that your telephoto as well as photo lenses will be perfect for your this trip. Sorry, that one day I decided to do a webinar, she's decided to stay up with me. So sorry, everyone, please excuse us. And I'll continue. Yeah, so I was telling you that the reason for telling, going through this, uh, the wildlife bit is also to tell you that there is enough opportunity for telephoto as well as macro photography on this trip, right? Um, and moving forward. On this expedition, you will be joined by two great apes, that is an expedition leader, as well as a very good local guide who will be with you throughout the trip from the first day to the last, exploring these forests with you. Besides them also, at each destination, we have local guides uh, who, or local people that you meet. Hotels. We have really comfortable hotels throughout the trip, um, except in the classic itinerary for that one night in Turtle Island. Uh, the accommodation is very, very basic, and the food is also a very simple 
um, spread a simple buffet like a mess or a canteen. Uh, that's the kind of uh, accommodation, but otherwise we have really comfortable hotels. In fact, our last place of stay, our last accommodation in Danum, which is the Borneo Rainforest Lodge, is actually one of the best wildlife lodges in the world. Yeah, so that's where our last destination is going to be. Uh, coming to the food, there are opportunities to try some really delicious, wonderful Malaysian local food. Um, the, the Borneo part of Malaysia is actually even more special because uh, it is a place which is like a melting pot of so many different ethnicities, like Indonesian, Malaysian, Indian, Chinese, it's all there, right? So uh, the food also is really, really interesting, like the laksa here and the roti chennai. The other photograph here are some of my favorites. But having said that, almost all of our hotels and all the restaurants, almost all the restaurants that we go to, there is an opportunity to try uh, local food, but also there is availability of Western food. So if you have any dietary requisites, restrictions or even preferences, please, please talk to your expedition leader and your local guide. Uh, they will try their best to organize if it's not available also. There are ways that we can organize a food of your preference uh, almost through the entire trip. Yeah. Uh, moving on after that, a very, very important part of the know before you go is the weather and the packing list. Now, like I said, and as you saw on the map, that the island of Borneo is just above the equator. It is a perfect tropical habitat. Here in front of you is a graph. You don't need to read through each bit of it, but it just gives you an idea that there's hardly any variation in temperature or humidity throughout the year, right? From January to December, the daytime temperature only shifts by a couple of degrees. This is in centigrade. I put it here in Fahrenheit. So from about 90 degree Fahrenheit during the day maximum to about 75 degree Fahrenheit in the evening, right, in the night. This is the average temperature. Uh, however, from destination to destination, there are some variations in temperature that you will experience. So when we are in Kuching, for example, on the coast, it tends to be warmer, but there, there is usually some breeze. However, when we go to Danum in the last destination where we are surrounded by the rainforest, uh, it tends to have cooler evenings, right? So that's about the temperature. Look at the humidity here in the brown line. It's pretty much the same throughout the year and it's very, very high, right? Uh, we often, our guests underestimate the temperature and the humidity of this area, but it's both are quite high, yeah? We run our trips from March going on to early October. Uh, these are, uh, what we call, so in Borneo, we often joke, there is a rainy season and there's a rainy year season, right? So we are in the rainy season part of it. Uh, rainfall uh, showers are very common. Uh, you might have a day or two or three that are completely dry, but usually there's a small or a big shower almost every day, right? So that's about that. Uh, and so keeping that in mind, Let's look at your packing list. So short and long sleeve shirts, both are okay. I prefer long sleeve shirts, one, to protect me from the sun as well as from mosquitoes and other bugs. So full sleeve shirts are great. However, um, short sleeve shirts, half sheep shirts and t-shirts are useful for times when uh, either you're on the beach or um, on travel days or you know, after a whole day out when you shower and you come for dinner in the evenings, it's okay to put on um, short sleeve shirts also. Same with pants, long pants, uh, tight knitted, light, long pants are highly recommended. 
Uh, you can also carry a pair of shorts, but they are uh, not really recommended when you're walking through uh, on, on a jungle trail, right? However, along with that, we highly recommend you carry bug spray. So even if you're wearing shorts or short sleeve shirts, if that's a more comfortable thing for you to wear, you can always use bug spray, right? Um, after that, rain jackets, very, very highly recommended. Uh, rain pants also, you can carry them if you want. Um, Sometimes the showers are quite heavy and they can be useful on certain days. However, if you're not, other than these two, another option is to carry a poncho. It's very useful. It actually works quite well on this trip because ponchos tend to be airier, right? Uh, and they also protect you from the rain. So it's a perfect thing to carry. If you have one, I would highly recommend it. Uh, other than that, in clothing, a warm jacket. Now you'll tell me why would someone need a warm jacket? Um, I just put this here in the list because sometimes certain indoor restaurants tend to have their air conditions uh, on quite low temperatures, and we have found these uh, useful on days on you know meals like that. And many of you often carry a jacket for your international flights, right? So that that one's fine. That can work for these few meals as well. Other than that, for the classic itinerary, there may be an opportunity to snorkel. The snorkel mask and the pipe are available um, for renting over there, but if you'd like to carry your own, please feel free to do that. Swimming costumes are useful, again, if you're snorkeling, but also in our hotel in Kuching, the first hotel, there is a lovely pool if you have the time and you'd like to use it. It's very useful. The reason why I've put a full sleeve rashi picture here is to remind me that during snorkeling, we do that in the afternoon post lunch, and the sun is can be quite hot and can cause uh, tans and burns. So these are quite useful uh, it, during those times. Or of course, you can also use a sunblock cream, but make sure you carry one that is uh, ocean friendly. Yeah. So what else do you need to pack? Okay, before I move on to that, regarding shirts, t-shirts, and pants, it is useful to have uh, multiple pairs. It tends to be really hot and sweaty. You will need a different shirt every single day. However, having said that, all the places, almost all the places where we stay for two nights and three nights, there is laundry service available. So you will have an opportunity to uh, sort of get your clothes washed also. Yeah, yeah. I think I've covered everything on this one. Let's go to the next. What else do you need to carry? Hats and caps, very, very useful. Sunglasses, very useful, especially when we do the boat transfers, very, very useful. But also, don't forget your reading glasses. Um, pool towels, um, are uh, something that I recently learned about. They're easily available on Amazon. It is a napkin that you can put around. Uh, it's, called, it's called a pool towel. You put it around your neck and as, and you use it to sort of wipe your sweat and all that. And as the napkin gets cool, it also acts as a cooler. Yeah, so that's the cool napkin or the cool towel. Many sports people use it apparently. Other than that, in footwear, to have waterproof footwear is useful. Um, you could use something like a sandal like this, but even closed toed um, sandals are useful just so that you don't stub your toe, uh, uh, you know, on branches or rocks, or roots or rocks on the floor. Good hiking boots, very, very useful for when we do the walks in the, in the forests. Other than that, flashlight, either kind is useful, either a headlamp or a small flashlight in the hand. Of course, a backpack, very, very necessary. And if you want, you can also carry a cover for your backpack for when it rains and to protect your gear inside. Water bottle is going to be your best friend during this trip um, because hydrating is so important. Camera. Any kind of cameras that you have, 
you can pack, they're all very useful. Even phones do a great job for a lot of different kinds uh, of photography during this trip. Sunblock. Last but not the least, very, very important. Please carry sunblock. Make sure that it, your sunscreen is not too sticky and oily because already uh, it tends to get uncomfortable in that weather. And if you can bring ocean friendly sunscreen, that would be fantastic, right? Uh, so here's a set of pictures that we put together for you to see on what to expect, like why are we asking you to carry some of these things? So waterproof shoes for times that we have wet landing, they are very, very useful. You will have walks on the beach, they're useful at that time also, right? This kind of trails, boardwalks, we'll be doing them a few times during the trip. Canopy walks also, there are a few different kinds. So on these kind of walks, it's very useful to have full pants and full sleeve shirts, right? You'll also have walks like these through the forest. Um, and there are some, some of these areas where we, you'll see that all of our guests are wearing leaf socks, right? Uh, this is because in our last destination in Danum Valley, where we are living in the rainforest, there tend to be leeches, right? And also you'll have trails like this. Where you may pick up a leech, but don't worry about it. It is one of the most harmless uh, human parasites. They carry no, no human diseases at all, right? They might give a bite, which heals and we move on, right? Any questions about this? I'm happy to uh, answer them. However, we do give lead cells, like I mentioned. Right, so after that, moving on. So yeah, while a lot of our exploration during this trip is on foot, there are a couple of days. Remember I told you about the riverside camp that we are staying in? We will be exploring the forest over there uh, using speedboats. So we go up and down the river and uh, try to look for wildlife on either, either side on the banks. Yeah? It's a very, very pleasant, a very beautiful experience. Uh, having said all this, all of these activities that you saw, we also do some of these in the night as well. Of course, none of the activities are compulsory, but uh, doing the boat ride or some of the walks at night, it just gives us opportunity to see the nocturnal world of Borneo, right? Birds sleeping or the, the flying squirrels, they only fly at dusk and at night, right? So that's our only chance. And of course, the total viewing only happens after dark because that's when they come from the sea to the islands for nesting, right? And these are just a few examples. There are many more creatures that we look for in the night as well. That's why your flashlight, very, very important. What do we have next? So other than sort of uh, exploring the jungles and the mangrove forests and the beaches, uh, we also will be visiting three different sort of rehabilitation and conservation centers during this trip. Uh, two of them are orangutan conservation centers and one is the sunbed conservation center. The reason we do this is uh, though these are semi-wild animals and not wild wild, but these make for excellent opportunities to view these animals close up. In fact, for the sun bear, there is actually extremely slim chances of seeing it in the wild. It is an extremely shy, it's the smallest bear in the world and a very, very shy creature, right? So this is the only way we can get to see it. Also, these centers are doing some amazing work and it's excellent opportunity for us to learn about the work to learn about the natural history of these creatures and also it's our way of supporting it, right? We buy a ticket to go in uh, to sort of spend time at these centers and uh, it's usually quite a nice experience. Again, having said that, there are no guarantees, especially with the orangutan center that you will definitely see an orangutan, uh, especially in Semengo. Sometimes during fruiting season, they don't even come uh, to the viewing areas, right? They are shy, they're free, they do what they like, right? Which is kind of amazing thing to know. 
Let's see, what do we have after that? Yes, let's talk about the difficulty level. I'm sure many of you must be wondering about this because we always talk about walks and things like that. So let me uh, take you through it. So our walks are usually in level area. They're usually in flat area. So sometimes you'll be walking on boardwalks, sand, um, sort of forest trails sometimes, um, sometimes of the canopy, but they usually tend to be level. Sometimes you have slopes, but they're not steep slopes. They're usually gentle slopes, except for this one optional hike that we offer in our last destination, but that's optional. There'll be two activities offered. People who would like to do a more strenuous walk, they are, they'll be taken to uh, the trek, but the others will do a regular forest trail. Now, having said that, it is the heat uh, and the humidity that makes even short walks quite difficult and very, very tiring, right? Um, People, our guests react differently. Some acclimatize to the humidity and the heat while some find it difficult to do so. However, remember, we are always minimum two guides with you. We can always split the group into two sort of walking pace and walking speeds, and everyone can still enjoy and explore these areas. Um, right? And in many times, we also have more than two guides, so it's not a problem to split the group up. Also, an easy way to deal with gentle slopes or walks is walking poles. Uh, many guests I find that are comfortable bringing their own walking poles. So if you have your own walking poles that fold well and fit in your bags, feel free to bring them. Uh, if not, in Dhanam especially, where most of our walks happen, uh, walking poles are available at the lodge. Other than that, cool towels, like I already covered, there is this wonderful ionic uh, fizzy drink called 100 Plus that's available in Borneo. We always have it available throughout the trip. It's a great way to rehydrate your body and uh, you know restock on your um, uh, elect electrolytes, right? Other than that, of course, there's water, very, very important. Having said that, we try to plan our days in such a way that you have downtime in your air-conditioned, comfortable rooms um, so that there's time to rest and recuperate uh, before you go out on your next activity. Yeah, so um, that's about the difficulty level. There's not a ton of walking. There's rarely a ton of walking. Uh, sometimes in Danum, depending on where wildlife is seen, we end up uh, walking more or less, but it's never strenuous miles of walking. It's never like that, right? So um, with that, I think I've covered almost everything all of you need to know on this trip. And I would like to open up uh, to all of you for questions. All right, thank you so much, Pyle. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. Okay, so let's get to some questions today. So, are, should I waterproof my hiking boots? Is that necessary? Uh, water resistant shoes are useful. Waterproof are better because sometimes when it rains too hard, um, your shoes tend to get wet and it doesn't dry easily in that weather. It's so humid. So yeah, waterproof is a great idea. Even though we are not crossing streams and things like that, uh, waterproof shoes are very useful. Should uh, I wear tennis shoes or should I have something better than that? Tennis shoes are okay for travel days. Uh, they are okay for wearing within the lodge. Uh, there are some lodges, though I must say two of our lodges, uh, we actually take our shoes off to enter the dining area, right? So uh, for those uh, slip and slip on shoes or your waterproof shoes are useful. The ones that I showed you like sandals, those are very useful. 
uh, but tennis shoes aren't enough for the forest trails. Uh, also, sometimes the boardwalks tend to be slippery, so you want good hiking shoes with good grip. Great, thank you so much for that. So, um, what animals uh, do you think we'll be able to see on this trip? Will we see a leopard? So, Borneo has the clouded leopard, right? And it is a nocturnal cat and very elusive. It's very, very difficult to see one. However, there have been night have trips. Um, actually, just last year, two of our departures had uh, excellent um, clouded leopard sightings. Uh, I haven't seen one, uh, but yeah, other than the clouded leopard, there are so many other amazing creatures. Like I said, this is a highly biodiverse region. There are like seven different kinds of monkeys, primates that you're likely to see, right, on this trip, including the nocturnal ones. Um, there are also um, the bearded pig, if you're lucky, the pygmy elephant. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot of things, and these we are only talking mammals, yet, right? If you look at the birds, it has an amazing diversity of birds, reptiles, lizards, snakes, amazingly beautiful frogs. We've seen such pretty frogs um, out on our night walks. Beautiful insects, beautiful moths, butterflies, beetles, bugs, just really, really pretty things. So I know I can't answer this question. There's a lot to see. However, having said that, these are dense forests and you really have to search for wildlife. It's not like how one sees things out in the open in the savannas. They're not in these large mountains. So that is a different experience. Uh, but yeah, these forests are really, really rich. Very, very rich. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> Thank you so much. So wh what is the elevation of Borneo? So we are mostly, yeah, very interesting question. So uh, Borneo, um, as uh, the island, is obviously all around the edges, right? The coast is all flat. It's uh, almost sea level. Only when you come to the central part of the island is where the highlands are, the highland area. However, we are not going to those highland areas. We are mostly going to be at sea level and just a few meters higher in Danum Valley. But yeah, we are quite low uh, to, to sea level. Thank you for that. So yeah. on Turtle Island, are swim fins available as well as masks and snorkels? Yes. So fins, masks, uh, masks and snorkels are available at Turtle Island. Uh, you can uh, rent them out. Also, they have beach mats that are available. Uh, however, if you're sometimes, um, usually they have a good stock of sizes and things like that. It's not an issue. Uh, but if someone wants to use their own, I recommend they carry their own uh, uh, snorkel and mask. Great, thank you. So do the guides know how to ID birds on the trip? Yes, our guides know how to ID birds. Uh, expedition leaders are also quite good at their birds, but our local guides are exceptionally good. Um, also in uh, Danum Valley, where, which is like a great birding area and uh, where we are going to spend three nights. Over there, we, along with the expedition leader and the local guide, there will be another lodge guide who will be joining us. And they tend to be really good with birds as well. You'll be, you're well covered. All right, thank you so much. So should I bring a tripod with my camera equipment? Um, on this trip, it's not very necessary. Uh, and also it can be a bit of um, a liability, so to say, because you tend to have your backpacks, you'll have your camera gear, uh, and we are often doing walks, right? So lugging the tripod can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, also fixing it each time quickly 
to you know for birds or other wildlife it's not really easy uh, some of the places where i can think of tripods being useful is at the conservation centers because they are proper you know wooden boards where you stand and you have time to put the tripod and all of that but over there again it's not necessary there tends to be a railing where you can rest your hand on a pillar that you can rest against uh, if you're using a big lens um, other than that our other exploration is on the boat and on the boat it's really not useful to have a tripod so yeah all in all overall if you see there might be a couple of occasions where a tripod is useful uh, but i I don't know if you want to lug it all the way just for those times. Great, thank you for that. Do you, do you have a recommendation for maybe what kind of a lens we should use? Uh, so yeah, uh, telephoto lenses are good. I'm not extremely well versed with the new uh, mirrorless cameras, which tend to have uh, fantastic sensors. And uh, I've seen guests getting amazing photographs of, um, creatures that are far away with a 500 mm lens, right? Uh, so if that's the case, 500 mm is great. That's your max. You, you'll probably get all that's to see in that lens. Uh, other than that, macro lenses are uh, 90 mm, 100 mm macro lenses are also very useful, especially if you're interested in the smaller creatures. For landscapes and things like that, there are a couple of opportunities for beautiful landscape shots, uh, especially on our first destination in Baco when we go out. There are these beautiful um, sandstone cliffs that are carved out uh, over thousands of years, right, and make these beautiful um, structures. Um, but for those, even your phones nowadays have excellent lenses. So if you're not, don't want to carry another wide angle lens just for these things, uh, your phone does an excellent job. So if we do bring a, our, some extra camera equipment and we want to leave it behind when we're out on walks, will we have to worry about where we're storing it or will it be kept safely? It's very safe to leave your extra lenses behind. There's no problem at all. All of our uh, lodges and hotels where we're staying, they have locks, you can lock your rooms. Um, and also, even if you don't, it's actually generally all the places where we're staying are very, very safe. Um, having said that, uh, if there are people here interested in uh, camera and photography, one thing that we always recommend, and I'm sure your expedition leader will tell you this, um, you know, before your trip starts is that the humidity in that area is so high, sorry for repeating this over and over again, that when you walk out of your rooms, right, uh, in the mornings or in the afternoons, whenever, the temperature difference tends to fog your lens up completely. And that fog takes a long time to get off your um, lens. So we always recommend that when you're in your rooms, you put your cameras in a space that does not have the direct draft of the air conditioning. So places like the bathroom, for example, you know, if you find a nice dry corner in the bathroom, that's a great, great place to uh, store your camera away uh, when you're not using it, when you're resting in the rooms, uh, or you put your camera outside your room at least half an hour before it's time to leave the room, so that the camera has time to adjust to the new temperature and to defog. Uh, other than that, we recommend carrying silica gel packets that you can keep in your camera case, which absorbs moisture. Um, and uh, you can also carry a sort of a good lens cloth. So these are a few recommendations for people interested in photography. Great pile, thank you for the, those tips. So let me ask you this, will the guide have a spotting scope with them? And is it something that the guests can borrow? Oh, uh, we don't usually carry a spotting scope throughout the trip. However, we will have binoculars and uh, we recommend that you carry binoculars also. Wow, that's a big one I missed out in the packing list, by the way, please carry your binoculars. Uh, we will be carrying us. However, in Danum, in our final spot, uh, there are a couple of spotting scopes available 
there which we use uh, during excursions, especially when we are walking on the main trails. When we take the very narrow trails, it's almost uh, useless to have uh, spotting scopes because the forest around you is so dense. Uh, you're often looking straight up into high trees, looking for wildlife also. Trees are really, really tall. So scopes are not uh, extremely useful throughout the trip. But yeah, in the last destination, we'll have access. Great, thank you. So are there luggage weight limits on internal flights? Yes, so it's about uh, 20 kilos. I think kilos. I'll have to get Thanks. back to you on that actually. It's about 15 to 20 kilos, about 30 to 40 pounds. And that's something that they can confirm with their adventure specialist. Yes, to. they can. Yes, please. Yes. Please. Excellent. So are there any vaccinations required? Malaria, for instance? Anything? Uh not really. So uh we so Maleron. There are malaria mosquitoes, but uh, one could take Malron, but it's better to just use your bug spray. You will have your bug spray. So that's a much better way of uh, protecting yourself from all kinds of insects over there. Great, thank you. How about local currency? Is that something that we should carry? Should we exchange before we get there? You could, uh, however, uh, most of the places say, so you might need a local currency for basic souvenir shopping uh, in some of the places or for laundry or for alcoholic beverages or some, some things of that nature. For that, you can uh, exchange currency. You will have the opportunity to do that in the first destination in Kuching, which is your first place where you land. Uh, over there, very close to the hotel, we have uh, many exchange uh, centers, and you could do it there. Uh, your expedition leader can recommend you. You can talk to them on the first day. They can recommend, uh, as for your needs, how much you might need to exchange, and uh, they'll also show you to the exchange spot. Yeah. Thank you. So w where is the boat trip? What river is that on? The river is called Kina Batangan. That's the name of the river. Uh, you can look it up. And the, the, the resort where we are staying is called the Kina Batangan Wetland, Wetland Resort. Uh, and that is, again, in Sabah, the state of Sabah of uh, Borneo, Malaysia. So I, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Let's get back to money for a second. Uh... Can I use my credit cards at the hotel? Yes, most uh, most places accept credit cards. Uh, you will be okay to use your credit card, yes. Great, thank you for clarifying that. So when dressing, should we, should we consider uh, a different kinds of clothing if we're going out to the market or church or to going out to dinner? Do we need to have formal dress at all? No. Just the field clothes that I covered uh, during just casual clothes, casual field clothes are uh, perfect throughout the trip. Um, just something that keeps you comfortable in a warm, humid weather is what you should keep in mind, but no formal clothing is required on this trip. So if I was going to come in early or stay a couple of days late, are, are there any good opportunities for nature adventures near Kuching or Kona Kinabula, if we have time? Yes. So uh, Kuching has a few uh, good opportunities, uh, some good excursion areas. Again, they are not necessarily pristine forests uh, always, but uh, for example, they have some dolphin watching trips that happen. You could probably sign up on those or you could get an extra um, visit to Semingo. Uh, there are also a few other trails over there uh, in Kuching where one can do some forest trails, but none of them are for um, big wildlife, for large wildlife, you know? So, uh, and if you talk about Kota Kinabalu, Kota Kinabalu is a very large city there is nothing in Kota Kinabalu one can do wildlife-wise, but they'll have to go out to other areas close by. 
So for example, there's something called, there's an area called Mount Kinabalu. Um, I think it's about a couple of hours drive from the city, I think two or three hours drive. And over there you could do a trail and you could do walks uh, and hikes to look for birds and uh, some really interesting other creatures. Great, thank you, Pio. Well, unfortunately, that's gonna be the last question that we do have time for today. So I'd like to hand it back to you for some closing comments. Um, oh, well, what can I say? It is a wonderful trip. Uh, every day is a surprise, even for us as expedition leaders, uh, no matter how much we prepare, uh, places like these come with their share of uh, surprises, uh, sometimes very good surprises, and sometimes it's a very big rainfall, a big day of rain. But don't forget to part your sense of adventure when you come for this trip. Go with the flow attitude. Those are going to be your most essential items on this trip. And with that, I promise you, you'll have a wonderful time on this trip. Just have an open mind and some big and small surprises are waiting to welcome you. All right, yep, Pyle. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. Now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NADHAB, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nadhab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links on our website at nadhab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.